1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Now, I know we've been here for a while, and I don't want you to get weary, but we're dealing with nine, <laughs> nine manifestations of spiritual gifts, and I just can't, I can't bring myself to blow through this. I want us to understand this. Two reasons. The Scripture says it's for the common good. We will, as a congregation, be benefited the better we understand this passage. And I want you to know increasingly and develop and embrace and express the charismata, the giftedness that God has placed in you when he saved you by his grace, when he, when he made you as Peter, a partaker of the divine nature. He implanted in you in the new birth these spiritual gifts. And I want you to know those. And I want us to understand, uh, particularly today as we look at the last portion of the list, the, the remarkable gifts, because we're going to move into uh, the rest of chapter 12 on the, on the body. If the, if the body doesn't know its functions, there's a word for that. If the body's not functioning, there's a word for that. It's called coma. The spiritual body be alert and alive and vibrant, full of vitality. And then, God willing, we'll move into 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says, here's how all these things ought to be addressed. They're not being addressed that way uh, in love. And then chapter 14, where he, where he really digs down into two manifestations of gifts, prophecy and tongues. And then I believe, when we get there, I'll show you the abuse of tongues taking place in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. I hope you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, and you can see us, and we want to make arrangements to put a Bible in your hands. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read for the sixth time this passage. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. What have we just read together, folks? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us today, and as we learn, may we be gripped with how important it is for him that we discover giftedness. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, as I said, this is the sixth time we've looked at this. I want to reference something to you. I hope you have a bulletin. We've printed on the bulletin now these many weeks this list that shows you that four places in the New Testament there are uh, spiritual gifts listed, which tells us that we don't really have a comprehensive list, but it tells us that this constitutes the majority, the overwhelming majority of the giftedness. I point out to you, if you're looking at it for the first time, that when you see a word in italics, that means it's previously appeared in another list. So I'll just call attention to something here. Prophecy in Romans 12. Prophecy in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to look at that today. Prophecy in Ephesians 4. Teaching, which is akin to prophecy in 1 Peter 4. I want to call that to your attention. We have told you before that when we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1, 
and he talks about concerning spiritual gifts. It's a, it's a, it's a word, pneumatica. It's uh, forget, concerning spiritual ones. You could translate that. Manifestation of spirituality, you could translate that. And he comes down in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 4. There are varieties of gifts. That's the word charismata. That's the, you get a word charismatic from that. Uh, these, are the, these are the nine manifestations he's going to list here in Corinthians. And the others, of course, you see on your bulletin uh, cover. This section, chapter 12, verse 1 to chapter 14, verse 40, concerns the use of spiritual giftedness in the body of Christ. Chapter 12 that we're in right now is a, a general survey of spiritual gifts. It emphasizes the common origin, the same spirit, the same spirit, that one spirit. You saw that as we read that. It discusses their remarkable diversity and their one great purpose. Chapter 13 gives a corrective to the way that this is happening in Corinth. Chapter 14, most of that deals specifically with the gift of tongues, plural, if you're reading ahead, pay attention when you get to chapter 14, how Paul speaks of tongues, plural, and a tongue, singular. That's going to be critical when we get there. He contrasts it with the gift of prophecy in chapter 14. and shows the superiority of prophecy. And then the passage closes uh, with general directions and exhortations concerning conduct in this setting, in the, in the corporate worship of the people of God. Um, so we're looking at this informed understanding of spiritual gifts. Someone wrote me this week, and I appreciate that so much. They said, have you already taught on this, or have you mentioned uh, the difference between a talent and a gift? And I went back to my notes, and to my surprise, I had not. So I want to do that now, because I think that's a very good question. And I'll simply just, just read to you um, natural talents, are the, uh, are the result of our God-given genetic inheritance and the training resulting from our family environment. For example, I will never be able to jump as high as Paul Ethan can jump. How tall are you, Paul Ethan? 6'6 six, six so far, all right. So that's, that's DNA. That's genetics. I might want to. I might imagine in my heart and mind that I can. But it's not going to happen. God designed us. It's a result of, of training also in our family environment. I would venture to say that uh, Joshua Askell's family uh, will be more musically inclined than most families. Josh plays the guitar and the piano. Mary plays the piano. Uh, they've got kids learning violin. They've got kids uh, learning guitars and, and, and drums. Uh, talent. Cultivated talent. And by, by the way, in talents, both believers and non-believers possess talents. I mean, you can turn on... Uh, up until the middle of June when the NBA Finals were over. In fact, you can turn on the, uh, the World Cup now. And there's some athletes that never give one thought for God who are incredibly talented. We say gifted, but we know we're not talking about charismata there. Incredible athletes. Spiritual gifts, however, are given to believers only in the act of the new birth. They're put there in, in, in diamonds in the rough, if you, if you please. And they're to be cultivated. They're to be matured. And as they are, they blossom. And they're used to glorify God, to serve others, and accomplish the common good of the body of Christ. That's a distinction. We're not talking about talents here. We're talking about spiritual gifts in this study. So I appreciate the question, and I hope that answer helps to clarify some things. When we think about the, this informed understanding, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. And so we're, we're taking that challenge as we've looked at how diversity is affirmed in verses 4 to 7. 
We're looking at how diversity is explained in 8 to 10, and that's where we are today. If you look at verse 10, we've already examined the utterance of wisdom in verse 8, the utterance of knowledge in verse 8, uh, faith, which is not saving faith, but the gift of faith in verse 9, gifts of healing in verse 9, working of miracles last week in verse 10, today prophecy, then the ability to distinguish between spirits, various kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. So let's look at prophecy. Prophecy is the gift of speaking for God under the immediate inspiration of the Spirit. In Acts 11, verse 28, there's a prophet named Agabus. One of them, verse 28, named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And we're just told that this took place in the days of Claudius. There was a, it was prophesied, it was foretold. Prophecy, by the way, has a, has a foretelling aspect to it and a forth telling or a telling forth. The foretelling aspect, as I hope you're becoming more and more aware, uh, if, if it still shows up, shows up when in territories where the gospel has not been taught where the scripture has not been available. There's still several thousand unreached people groups around the planet that have never been engaged with the gospel. You can expect these remarkable gifts to show up there as a, as a demonstration of power. We talked about that in, in, in miracles and healing. A demonstration of power. That power has arrived. And, and these, these places that, that it are not educated on the things of God will be impressed by the manifestation of divine power. Power. Prophecy foretells, though in our context today, it would primarily be a telling forth, a speaking truth. Uh, also, Philip's daughters, if you remember, in Acts 21, 9, 8 and 9, were told the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist. Remember, he's one of the, one of the early uh, deacons who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And we're not told how they did that, but they were, they were telling forth uh, the truth. They had a dad who loved Jesus, who was a servant, who had, who had offered himself up to be used, who was taken out of his uh, setting and taken to Samaria. He was there for the, what we call the Samaritan Pentecost, powerful movement of the Spirit. His daughters... were indwelt with this gift of speaking forth the word. When the scripture becomes complete, and we're going to see this in 1 Corinthians 13, so hang on. When the scripture, the canon is complete, put into its final order, things change. There is no need generally for telling forth if you have the scripture because the scripture tells us what's coming. As one preacher said, he said, I've read the end of the story and we win. Hang in there. Press forward. Don't give up. Where the scripture is not known, however, it's important to see God's power and God's plan in, in that kind of prophecy. But primarily today for us, it is the telling forth of what God has revealed in scripture. A preacher who's worth being called a preacher, who's not just reading the newspaper to you, not just telling you funny stories, but who's opening the scripture, uh, should be imbued with the gift of prophecy. When you read the prophets in the Old Testament, we're not given a, just a whole raft of information. They seem to be repeating a theme. When you look at New Testament preaching, it is by and large the theme in the New Testament of the crucified, risen Savior. Paul will say when we get to 1 Corinthians 14 in verse 3, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The gospel does that. 
He will say at the beginning of that chapter 14, pursue love, after talking about 1 uh, Corinthians 13. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy, the value of telling forth. Preachers are not the only ones imbued with the gift of prophecy. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a burden to share him with others, you ought to seek that to be developed in you. The capacity to say, thus says the Lord, to authoritatively open the scripture, whether across the table at coffee or whether standing before a crowd, wherever, to tell forth. And Paul will end the 14th chapter, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. So there it is. You, you see this, uh, and I, I showed you it's in all four lists, essentially teaching being the same. One writer said, the supremacy of prophecy to other gifts is the theme of chapter 14 when we get there. Real quickly now, let's look at just some things that the, that the New Testament says. First Thessalonians 5.20, Paul writing to the Thessalonians, do not despise prophecies. Don't, don't ever weary. I, I know people I don't know if you, who... who I was talking to a guy years ago who, who had been a minister. He was doing something else. And I began to talk to him. And he just, he looked at me and said, why are you telling me that? I know all that. Brothers and sisters, if you want to tell me about the Lord Jesus Christ, I have time for that all the time. I love I loved to tell the story. I love to hear the story. I never grow weary of the story. Do not despise prophecies. Revelation 19.10, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. John says, I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. I'm not, you don't worship a sinner saved by grace. That's a good word, by the way, to, to, for preacher worshipers, these people that are groupies. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And he says, but the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What's at the heart of prophecy? Jesus. You show me anyone who claims to have the gift of prophecy, who, is, who is, spends all his time uh, telling you what's going to happen, and when Jesus is going to come, and, and this, is, this means this, and this newspaper article means this. That is not, according to Revelation, the spirit of prophecy. If he makes much of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he came to do, the work of Jesus Christ, the change he brings in the lives of those who receive his message, the anticipation of his return. You show me a man who makes, or a woman who makes much of Jesus Christ, I'll show you someone who probably is imbued with the spirit of prophecy. Then there's the, the seventh manifestation of the distinguishing between spirits. Uh, it enables a person to distinguish whether a person's speaking under divine inspiration from the impulse of his own mind or under the influence of an evil spirit. On the, on the next verse from Despise Not Prophecies, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 says, But test everything. Hold fast what is good. Anytime I bump into one of these fellows who says, I have a word from the Lord. I say, okay, where is it in the scripture? I can't find it here. I don't, I'm not interested in hearing it. If it doesn't jive here, now you want to paraphrase something? Be accurate with it. Much better to quote it. It's much more power than quoting the scripture. I got into it with a fellow one time years ago, and he just insisted that, that he had been given an utterance, he was misunderstanding the, the, the gift of utterance. And so I finally, I couldn't dissuade him, so I said, okay, here. I turned, I have, most Bibles have blank spaces in them. I said, you got a pen? Yeah, I said, write it down. Why? I said, write it down. Why? I said, because you're giving me revelation. And I don't want to miss any of God's revelation. Write it down. Well, he kind of got perplexed then. Discerning. Folks, Part of what's 
killing the church today in the West is we don't have discernment. And anybody can get up and say anything. And if you want to see pooled ignorance on the subject of, of God and his word, just get on Facebook. My, my, my. I read some of these guys getting some of these threads and think, you know, I have a question I've been wanting someone to answer for, for years for me, and I've read enough of, of what you have proposed is found in the Word uh, that I don't find. <laughs> someone, you can probably answer this question. Is ignorance bliss? Test things, folks. Te don't be like, like the baby birds we're watching out our window, our kitchen window, that just, everywhere they go, it's just. I, I wonder sometimes, is there anything they wouldn't swallow if it was stuck in? I, be discriminating. That's, that's this gift here, distinguishing between spirits. It's discerning. Satan comes as an angel of light. He wants to convince us there's, here's Satan's question that he teaches a lot of people to ask. Well, what's wrong with it? It's one of his favorite questions. See, the discerning believer who wants to honor God and his word asks the question, what is right about it? How does it fit the categories of noble, of good report, peaceable, wisdom from above? See, there's be discerning. The reformers recognized that you could, quote, make the scripture say anything you wanted it to say if you did not use contextual exegesis and exposition. And so they came, they came up with this term, the analogy of faith during the Reformation. The analogy of faith simply says this, that scripture is its own best interpreter. And brothers and sisters, we have we have Bibles today that have cross-references in them. We have concordances, uh, digitally, electronically. We can, we can find out. While masses are groping in darkness around the planet with not one, not one page, not one page from this book, we have access. And therefore, we have no excuse to be ignorant. Test the spirits. Christians with a gift of discernment have the God-given ability to recognize lying spirits and to identify deceptive and erroneous doctrine. Now look at Acts 17, 11 with me real quickly. Now the Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, these Bereans. They received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I, I would say this to you. Don't simply take my word for it. Now, the corollary is you don't, you don't have the liberty to reject what I'm saying out of hand. Just say, I don't know. But don't simply take my word for it. Test the scriptures. That's what they were doing for Paul. Examine. Is that what he said here? Does that line up here? Is there other scripture that, that supports this? If we did more of that, we would not be so easily led astray. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. If that was true in the first century A.D., do you get the impression it's less true in the 21st century? I don't. I think it is, it is exponentially more so today. Test the spirits. In Acts 16, verse 16 and 18, here's, the, here's an example of this. We were going to the place of prayer. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So she's demonstrating something like this foretelling aspect of prophecy we talked about. And they're making money off of her. She followed Paul and us crying out, 
These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Now, we don't have time to unpack all of this, but Jim, let give you a shortened version. But, but, but preacher, she was saying the truth. Yes, she was. And Paul did not want the message of the gospel identified with someone who was merchandising the gospel. He says as much in, in, chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Thank God we do not, as others, peddle the word of God for profit. And he was, he was troubled that, that this girl could get traction with this. Discerning the spirit behind it. Acts 5.3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? This is back when Ananias and Sapphira, remember, gave a gift to the church and then lied about the nature of the gift to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. Apparently there were some things happening in Corinth where there was an absence of discernment. We remember one of them specifically in 1 Corinthians 5 where they were, where they were overlooking or winking at a situation where, where a, a, a young man was having an illicit relationship with his father's wife, probably this young man's stepmother. There was not any discernment there to recognize what they ought to do. The sons of Issachar in the Old Testament said were wise, able to discern the times that they lived in, knowing what Israel ought to do. That's discernment. This operation has changed somewhat again from the sign gifts uh, since the times of the apostles, but it is still very valuable uh, in the life of the, of the church because here, this is, our, this is our measure. This is what we test everything against, the completed word of God. People with discernment in the church are guardians. Protect the church from demonic lies, false doctrines, perverted cults, fleshly elements. It requires a diligent study of the word to be knowledgeable of the word. Don't expect the Lord to bring to your mind the truth of scripture that you haven't taken the time to engage. We don't become familiar with the scripture by osmosis. It's through study. And it helps, it's supportive to gifts of knowledge, wisdom, preaching, teaching. And then kinds of tongues, various kinds of tongues. This seems from what we read in Acts and what you read in various other places in the book of Acts, which is the place to study this before you go to Corinth, that this is the ability to speak known languages miraculously. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. There, there seems to perhaps be with this some manifestation of ecstatic utterance. We're going to take that up in 1 Corinthians 14. But look what happened at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. Well, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. They, were, they had gathered for Pentecost, remember? They were, many of these people were born in these foreign lands. They grew up learning these. They were the Jews of the dispersion that we looked at on Sunday nights when we were looking at the, at the intertestamental period. And that this sound, the multitude came together, this, this mighty rushing wind, this cloven tongues like fire lighting upon the, the 120 in the upper room. They came together, they were bewildered, what's going on? They, and they heard something. Each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Aren't all these people Galileans that are speaking? Their, their native tongue would be different from ours. Now, here's my best understanding. If you and I were at the United Nations and someone was getting up from Saudi Arabia to speak, we would have an earpiece we would put on. At the United Nations, they have translators, interpreters who, who speak, who are able to understand what's being said and interpret it to different groups in, in their own neighbor. And that's what we would hear. And that's the miracle of Pentecost. What's the significance of that? Pentecost is Babel reversed. In Genesis, when the people were, were getting too big for their britches and decided, we're going 
we're, we will dictate when we encounter God. We're going to build a tower to heaven so we can go up and see God anytime we want. God looked down upon them, was not pleased with that arrogant attitude, and he confused right there their languages. And instantaneously, people who had been communicating just a moment before could not communicate with one another. And they began doing something called babbling. And they were dispersed. At Pentecost, for a, for a brief window, you have Babel reversed. You have God coming in the power of the Spirit and the gospel is communicated. What had Jesus said to them in the commissioning passages in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? It's not given to you to know the times or the seasons which are kept in the Father, but here's what you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. What will be necessary to do that? The capacity to bridge the language gap. We have here, uh, Mary Askell has a background uh, with new tribes, missions. They have people on the field who spend years learning languages from people groups where their language is not written down. And they put their language down in recorded form and then learn from that, learn the language and then learn to communicate the gospel. Years these precious committed Christians do that. There's a movie. Mary's are called Etau. If you can get your hands on Etau E-T-A-U I think you can get your hands on ETAW, or E-T-A-W. You need to watch it. It's the culmination of a missionary learning a previously unknown language and then communicating the gospel to them in that language. And what happens is astounding. Well, this happened in a moment at Pentecost. From all over the known world, people there. And they began to stand and preach, and they're hearing it's, it's, the, it's Babel reversed. It's the, it's the UN connection long before there was any audio assistance electronically. What does that do? It communicates the gospel. It demonstrates the power of the gospel. Power is big. We talked about that last week. And that's the first evidence of speaking in other tongues. We need to hang on to that. Well... This happened also uh, at the house of Cornelius. Look at Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. Peter is snatched off a rooftop where he's, where he's meditating and a, and a sheet drops down with all these animals that under the Old Testament were considered unclean. And a voice from heaven comes and says, take and eat. And Peter says, oh, no, Lord. Uh, my lips will never touch that kind of stuff. I'm a, uh, uh, no, no. It's unclean. God said, don't you call anything I've made unclean. Now, with that lesson burning in his mind that he has to retrain himself in terms, of, in terms of his own diet, get over being a Jew, trapped in the ceremonial law. With that lesson, God says, go, and I want you to go to a Gentile's home, preach the gospel to him. And he does. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter, so you've got Jewish believers who would have the same hang-up Peter had, probably were, probably were mortified, find themselves in a, Jews, in, in a Gentile's home. That would have disqualified them from going to the synagogue as a Jew. They were amazed. <laughs> because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? How? Just as we have. What's he referencing? Pentecost. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Then they asked him to remain for some days, and I'm sure there was some teaching that went on. Paul encounters believers at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, 1 to 7. It happened that, the whole, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. They trusted in Jesus. He said, into what name were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. So, so apostles or disciples of John the Baptist had made their way proclaiming the gospel. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 of them. This is Acts. Various tongues, primarily. In Acts, exclusively. Languages they had not heretofore known, but languages that were knowable nonetheless. That's the Acts experience of speaking in various tongues. And we're going to deal with this more, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here today. We're going to dive into this in, in chapter 14. And then the interpretation of tongues. These are temporary sign gifts using normal words for speaking a foreign language and translating it like the others, miracles and healings. They were for the authentication of the truth and those who preached it. What happened in Cornelius' home? Didn't that validate for Peter that these Gentiles were saying? Keep on reading in Acts past that, by the way. He goes back and gives his report. And here's the response of the believers who were of a Jewish background. So then you're telling me that God has granted even to the Gentiles repentance unto life? As Gentiles. They didn't have to become proselyte Jews first. This was the, the Jerusalem council in Acts 15 was built on this. How does a Gentile become a Christian? He becomes a Christian by confessing faith in Jesus Christ. This was significant. And so you have this interpretation of tongues. People gifted to bridge the gap. I don't hear this happening so much anymore, but there was a season years and years ago when, when people would be able to miraculously interpret something they heard in a language they had not previously known. Again, it's about power. It's about authentication that the gospel has come here too. We won't go into it today. We talk about it a lot on Wednesday nights. This is something similar. This is happening in the Middle East among Muslims. The powerful, miraculous manifestation. So these sign gifts, which were being used, and I think I would suggest are still today in areas where the gospel has not been written down, the scripture has not been completed, and then you can expect to see something like this as authentication that God is at work, that he is saving these people these unreached peoples, we can ex expect it to continue. But to, but to make it important in a culture that trips over Bibles misses the point entirely. And one writer says he thinks that it was, it was tongues and interpretation of tongues that was really running amok in Corinth. And we'll, we'll see why in chapter 14. Then finally, this diversity summarized. The, the nine manifestations of giftedness listed in Corinth, Corinthians. All these, verse 11, are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. All these manifestations, the same Spirit. The Spirit does not work against himself. The Spirit works in harmony with God the Father and God the Son. So when, when in a manifestation, a so-called manifestation of spiritual gifts, you have confusion and chaos and cacophony, you do not have the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's his point here. He stresses the diversity of gifts, the singular source, the Holy Spirit. 
This is five times now in this chapter that Paul has mentioned that the source of the gifts is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the gifts are not something we work up on our own. The gifts are not something we, we seek, as I was taught erroneously to do in seminary. We'll talk about that sometime. But to be received by the Spirit as He wills. He alone is the one who works or energizes all gifts as He chooses. That's what this verse says. So we ought to seek to know. Lord, you've saved me by your grace. I want to be used at maximum efficiency, maximum capacity. Teach me. Cultivate in me. Use me. That's it. A fellow said to Vance Havner one time, old Southern Baptist evangelist who's gone to be with the Lord now, he said, Dr. Havner, I just want God to use me. And he said, son, you make yourself usable, God will wear you out. He'll wear you out. For the common good, brothers and sisters, because Jesus Christ died and rose again and sent his spirit to fill us with himself and cultivate in us the necessary tools and means to advance the gospel. You can't do that and be half-hearted about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got you to dive in at the deep end. You can't date the church. You'll never know these things if you date the church. But if you give yourself to Jesus and say, I'm going to love what you love, Jesus, and you hear Christ love the church and gave himself for it, you'd be amazed at how God will birth and build and cultivate in you and work through you for the common good of the people of God and the advance of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you now in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, help us to avoid the ditches. They're there. Brothers and sisters in Corinth were apparently stuck in a ditch. We don't want to be stuck in that one or the one opposite it. We want to be walking the gospel path, growing and flourishing, manifesting the reigning power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. to honor you and to bless one another, to serve, to be followers of Jesus Christ, committed to advancing the gospel until Jesus comes. So teach us, Lord. I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters here that you will just stir up and cultivate and, and just blossom and mature the many-faceted giftedness that you've placed in each one. To the praise of your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.